So I'm Lucy Shea, I'm the Group CEO of Futera, and I really want to extend a warm welcome to you all dialing in from wherever you are in the world. And we are talking today about the Modern Slavery Act, uh, but even wider about due diligence. And if we start with the starting point of slavery and modern slavery, our introduction really is that it should be safe to assume that slavery is a tragedy of the past. We live in this world filled with progression and innovation, and still we have around 50 million people who are still victims of modern slavery. So it's crucial that government, businesses and civil society work together towards a solution. Now in this webinar, we're going to discuss due diligence and its role in the goal of eradicating modern slavery and negative environmental impact in supply chains. We'll be looking at the legislative landscape. And so what I'll do now is I'll do a brief introduction to us at Futera, um, and then I'm going to go to each of our panelists by turn. Um, we've got Baroness Lowly Young, we've got Jackie Engel, welcome so much. And we'll go to each of you in turn and we'll have a short presentation and then it's going to be open for chat. So please feel free to, as I say, get your questions in, um, think of your questions throughout. So Futera, we're a change agency. You can have a look at our website for all our case studies on work that we do. Um, in our consultancy. We also run a training business called Academy. We're a B Corporation. Um, we're the first climate solutions provider accredited by uh, the Race to Zero, an exponential roadmap, um, working on solutions to climate and climate justice. We're majority female owned. We have worked for a long time on transparency and due diligence with our partners. Um, for example, we published the Honest Product research and guidance with the Consumer Goods Forum over the last few years. And I myself sit on the board of um, Fashion Revolution and part of the UNFCCC Fashion Charter. And we love working with partners on solutions to climate and equity. So please do um, get in touch. Now, um, what we're gonna do in this webinar is Lola first is gonna place us very much in the legislative context. Um, Lola's going to explain what we can expect and how we might approach it um, with regard to due diligence. Um, and, you know, lots of points around there, which I'll let Lola cover. Um, Jackie is going to go, go on with a real of a deep dive into women in living wage and some of the innovative new legislation that's coming out, such as the EU ban on forced labour. Now, um, having known uh, these two speakers, Lola for a long time, Jackie for a short time, I can already say these two women have honestly forgotten more about due diligence than most people will ever know. They're also really interested, I know, in multi-solving. So we're gonna be looking at human rights, but also the environment. We'll be looking at how you raise the legislative floor, but also how you break through with innovative solutions. And both have a really deep expertise in fashion, but much that is also relevant and applicable to other sectors. So that's the plan. But with these two wonderful speakers, we could go anywhere. Um, but Lola, I'll hand over to you. I'll do a small introduction and I'll hand to you. Um, so Lola is a writer and campaigner. She was appointed to the House of Lords in 2004 as an independent crossbench peer. Um, Lola has been a board member of several cultural and creative organizations. She's presented the podcast series, The Color Green. And Lola is currently Chancellor of the University of Nottingham. I think you've even been there and back today, uh, this week, Lola, in the snow. <laughs> Lola is co chair of the Foundation for Future London and an NED with Bloomsbury Publishing. So, welcome, Lola. Over to you. Thank you, Lucy. And I know you forgot to say I'm an NED with Butera, um, <laughs> which is absolutely key. And it, 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 it's key because um, I'm delighted to be working with colleagues at Butera, of course. But the, the, the reasons for bringing us together has been around this recognition that we need to link human rights 
at social justice with environmental justice. And in my view, you can't have one without the other. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And interestingly, I was saying to Jackie, and Lucy, just before we started, I felt quite emotional because I've been at a meeting in Parliament, which for me crystallises this whole theme of how we need to be thinking about multi-solving, as, as Lucy puts it. So just a very, very quick um, uh, outline of, of, of what I was listening to. I was hearing from some indigenous people who live in, in, in Brazil and were deeply, deeply impacted by the Mariana Dam disaster, which took place in 2015. BHP, the mining company involved, are currently uh, being sued. Um, with it, and, if, and if it's successful, it'll be the most, it'll be the hugest amount of compensation ever um, awarded. But listening to those people, the key point is, and that one has to say this most frequently happens to black and brown people. And these people were saying, it doesn't matter how much you pay us, that river is destroyed. And with it, our religion, our sense of community, our understanding of the world, our relationship to the world. And we wouldn't be able to clean up even the smallest part of that river in 50 years. So, you know, so people who cannot see that relationship between human rights and environmental justice, we need to open our eyes to that. And that includes businesses, of course. And it shouldn't be necessary to have to go through all of the machinations of taking companies to court because it shouldn't be happening in the first place. And companies like BHP, who it is alleged, um, knew all about what was happening and were using this kind of sticking plaster type remedy, you know, to deal with it until the thing became literally so big, nobody could deal with it. And I use that as an example because I want particularly those who work in um, commercial organisations in the private sector to think very carefully about what all that means. I can say that I'm deeply emotionally affected as I was, but nobody wants to see Lola Young crying in the corner about a disaster on the other side of the world. What we want to see is businesses stepping up to and understanding in all its complexity, their, relation, their responsibility to people and to planet. So you know, this idea that it's only about fi delivering financial profit to shareholders and everything has to be severely interrogated because too many people and the flora and fauna of the world are suffering as a result of this very sort of, um, uh, how can I say, short-sighted, almost introverted view that somehow, you know, making lots of money is the first uh, thing that we need to think about. So what is due diligence then? And what difference would it make if we had a much stronger legislative uh, framework? Well, if we look at the Modern Slavery um, Act, which was passed here in the UK in 2015 and had a very interesting um, section, section 54, which was about reporting on what steps have been taken by any company with a turnover of more than 36 million pounds, reporting on what steps they'd taken to ensure that there was no kind of modern slavery, forced labor, exploitative labor within their supply chains. So, which all sounds great. And at the time it sounded great, it sounded groundbreaking. Our government went around telling everybody it was the leading legislation in the world, kind of at the time, but it's not the case anymore. And what we've learned from the Modern Slavery Act and that particular section 54 is that unless you have something that's really robust, something that's really monitored and implemented in a really rigorous way, it's not going to make the difference we want it to. Now, that's not the same as saying is it's made no difference. And many businesses have said to me and to others that it's been a game changer, that piece of legislation. Well, we want to change the game again. And I think whatever you might think of the proposed legislation from the EU, it raises the level of debate and therefore what we might do to mitigate the worst impacts of irresponsible corporate behaviour. So, 
what we'd be looking at is something that wasn't just about reporting. Reporting is important. Transparency is, is, is important. And it's really, really important for businesses to know what happens, not only in their tier one suppliers, but all the way down the supply chain. It's no good saying, yeah, well, it's OK at tier one. And then you've got all of these other um, terrible things going on further down the supply chain. So, yes, and reporting transparency, a good thing. But ultimately, what, 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 what happens once you've reported it? Or even if you report it in the most meager way, as it's possible to do at the moment, it's possible simply to say, well, you know what, we really don't like modern forms of slavery, so you can trust us that it's not in our supply chains. Not good enough. And that's a, a flaw, a fundamental flaw in the legislation. So interestingly to me, many businesses have come forward and they said, look, this isn't leveling the playing field at all. Those of us who want to be responsible businesses are still being um, undercut by those businesses who don't care about it. So what, what is government going to do to legislate in this area? And as I previously mentioned, the EU has in mind and is, is currently hoping to implement or to enact in 2024, a whole raft of legislation under the somewhat cumbersome uh, title of mandatory due diligence, human rights and environmental um, um, uh, um, due diligence. Sorry, such a, such a long mouthful. I forgot the end of the the end of the, the name of it. So mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. And due diligence encompasses a whole range of activities. So this is not just about saying, yes, of course, we've, we've investigated um, uh, to see what's going on in our side supply chain. We've done our due diligence. That will not be good enough under the legislation. Um, the idea is to prevent OK, so why do we need to get into these situations in the first place and then report on the fact that we've done a bit of due diligence about them? No, what we need to do is to make sure that there are um, frameworks, um, guidelines, policies, strategies, clear monitoring frameworks for ensuring that this doesn't happen in the first place. But of course, we know it's not possible. It is not possible for every um, commercial organization to check all the way through its um, uh, supply chains, particularly at the moment where some companies still claim not to know what goes on further down. It's not possible to do all of that. So we are in the business of having to look at what is actually happening and saying, OK, we've been caught out something bad has happened here and this is what we're going to do about it. We're not going to simply report it and at best sort of say, well, OK, that was a bit of a loophole, so we'll do something about it the next, so it doesn't happen the next time. No, this should be remediation. Now, this is really important because, again, you know, looking those people in the eye that I was um, uh, in conversation with with other parliamentarians earlier today and seeing them and listening to them just just sort of saying, oh, we're sorry we did that. And I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll, we'll set up a foundation and we'll do this and we'll do that. It has to be something that is really, really strong and secure and negotiated with those people most affected in a way that puts them on equal basis to the company. So this is not about some sort of um, false sense of um, consultation. It's certainly not about greenwashing. You know, it, it's very interesting if you look at the, the company involved in that particular case. They, if you look at their website, great policies on, on uh, environmental sustainability and corporate responsibility. It's no longer good enough to pay lip service to these um, uh, so-called remedies. We want, re um, excuse me, real remedies. So um, uh, the, the guidelines mean the forthcoming guidelines mean that companies will have to specify the severity and the urgency of risks present in operations and business relationships and create a proper framework that will um, prioritize what has got to be tackled first and most importantly. This information has got to be publicly disclosed about, about their value change about naming um, uh, names and locations of places that, and people that have been affected. And importantly, of course, it's got to indicate policies and measures that will be implemented to cease, prevent, and mitigate risks for human rights and environmental harm. Okay, so 
the methodology used to do this and the stakeholders consulted um, uh, when defining their due diligence strategies will also have to be stated. And this, as I said earlier, is due to come into effect in 2024. So this is, a, is, is something of a leap forward in terms of what is expected of these businesses, certainly um, much more than has been expected of them through the Modern Slavery Act. But that, that piece of legislation that I've just referred to from the EU is not the only piece of legislation that's coming through. And Jackie will um, elaborate on some of these areas uh, when she comes to speak. But I'm also thinking about the New York Fashion Act, another very interesting piece of, of, of proposed legislation, which will try to ensure that um, uh, supply chain mapping, human rights mapping, mapping and reporting, environmental mapping and reporting, all of that is made public. So, you know, for, um, uh, and, and for any um, uh, contravention of any of these legal um, instruments, workers can pursue companies with, with claims. And that, you know, that is again, really important. So what I would hope is that if we can get some of this legislation through, and this is not only about Europe, by the way, and, or, and New York, there are other jurisdictions who have either already implemented or are looking at, at boosting the implementation of their current legislation in this area. Lucy pointed to you know, something towards 50 million people in modern forms of slavery and exploitation. They're not all in supply chains, of course, we understand that, but a good deal of them are. And the um, important thing to um, remember is that in times of conflict, and you know, in spite of what we might think, there are masses of areas of conflict around the world. In times where refugees are, are on the move because of um, environmental, uh, be, because of being displaced by environmental um, tragedies, all of these people are very prone, very um, vulnerable to being exploited and taken into uh, supply chains of one kind or another. We have examples of that in the UK. So again, this isn't just about something that happens over there. Now, so obviously in, in the space available, and um, in spite of what Lucy said, um, due to the limitations of my deep, deep knowledge, um, can't go into all the details here, but I think the fundamental principles are clear. This is about prevention. It's about robust um, legislative frameworks. It's about penalties for companies that do not conform. It's about the companies themselves ensuring that due diligence is really made to work and that where it doesn't work, workers, communities, um, and the environment, if you like, are compensated for what's happened under their watch. So to me, just finally to say that sort of underpinning all of this, you know, my question is, um, well, two questions, if you like. One is, can we make due diligence the new normal? And, you know, sort of, as I say, step up and, and introduce something that's much more robust. And that, you know, if, if businesses don't comply, they really are prosecuted for, which has never happened under the Modern Slavery Act. Um, and and what, are, what is business for? You know, what is a company for? Is it, is it purely to produce profit? And any, if, if, there's, if there are companies that really want to say, yes, all our, our mode, our whole sort of um, raison d'etre is to produce profit for shareholders and we really don't care about anything else, then please take down your greenwashing, purpose washing, virtue signaling policies on your websites and just be really kind of upfront about it because we need to know, you know, what, what is really going on in the commercial sector and, and who it is we can work with to get us out of this incredibly challenging um, set of, of conditions that, that we're facing. In, in 10 years time, hoping that we can survive over the next few years, I really don't want us to be facing these same questions um, again, because it's about time we all stepped up actually, and, and make sure, made sure that we contribute to um, uh, stopping the, these abhorrent practices. So I'll finish there for now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lola, um, and thank you for placing us so wonderfully, and I agree with your uh, parting thought on it would be nice to have a new set of problems, wouldn't it, after 2022? Um, 
Thank you as well for the uh, questions that I would love to return to after um, we've um, gone to Jackie. Um, and uh, your point uh, there around what is business for, obviously where you started was um, looking at responsibility wider than just financial responsibility uh, for shareholders. And I think that is something I would love if we get the chance to explore after Jackie's talk, because the new you know, trend and wave that we see for slightly different models like B Corporation, for example, I think are an interesting piece along with that. And, and you're, you know, you're, I, I loved your point also on greenwashing, because even greenwashing is getting more due diligence, monitoring with the CMA in the UK, with the uh, Norwegian Consumer Council, um, with the SLU coming in from New York again and the EU, and actually even getting some prosecutions there as well. So it's, it's again, which I think is a little a trend that we're seeing to more and more regulation and rules, which is kind of good. We need some more regulation and rules around justice and environment. So on that, Lola, as you did set up, Jackie, you're going to take us into, I think, a bit more of a deep dive into, well, talk to us about whatever you like, because again, I know <laughs> you know so much on this field, um, but particularly I think you'll be looking at the EU um, the proposed or actual ban on forced labour. But again, please do um, explore around the topic. We are all ears. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction and for inv inviting me to be part of this important discussion. I thought before I begin, it would probably be helpful if I give a bit more background to the work I do for the circle so that everyone understands the perspective I'm coming from. Um, um, so the Circle is a global feminist organisation. We were founded by Annie Lennox back in the day, 2012 or something. So as a global feminist organisation, our current strategy is focused on two key areas, which are the economic empowerment of women and ending violence against women and girls. And to this end, we, we work in two ways. So firstly, we support project partners on the ground who are working in these areas in their communities. And then secondly, we work by advocating for systemic change at policy level. And so I work on our living wage project, which is spearheaded by a team of pro bono lawyers and activists. And this project is focused specifically on, you know, a, the aim is legislative change that will ensure a living wage for garment workers in global fashion supply chain. Um, and so the reason we focus on garment workers is that we know that this section of the workforce is predominantly women, so averaging 80% on a global level. And we also know that these women are subject to some of the worst wages um, in terms of kind of global levels, and that these wages keep them trapped in a cycle of poverty and leave them vulnerable to a range of further abuses. And I always feel I want to add this caveat because sometimes it comes up, you know, we know they're not all production cities are like this. We know not all company supply chains, not all workers. We know that there are some facilities fulfilling best practice guidelines. There's been pilots that have brought great benefit to a portion of workers. But what we're talking about here is the majority experience, which isn't best practice model. And, you know, when we're talking about legislative change, in some ways, what we're talking about is wanting to roll out those pilots to everyone, roll out best practice to everyone. Um, so in terms of legislative landscape, I am going to kind of dig in sort of to the EU's forced labour proposals. But before I do, I was going to refer a little bit to a larger piece of mapping work that we've done recently, which kind of backs up kind of a lot of what Lola's been saying in terms of sort of some of the trends happening around the globe. So the mapping work we did was very focused on Sort of looking globally to see what initiatives were either newly passed or in process that would have import to this issue of living wages in the fashion industry and we looked at um, environmental measures because they often contain social chapters that reference wages and human rights we um, looked at measures related to the circular economy we looked at due diligence we looked at measures that were specific to sort of labor and wages and then there's a fifth category, which I'm not going to be able to remember right now. Um, but that document is it's kind of online in a, in a URL that is not linked, but is available publicly. So I'm happy for that to be shared after the webinar, if anyone would be interested 
to see that. And it is a working document. So it's something that I'm can updating and expanding with my limited resources. So, um, you know, I, you know, I'd love to kind of cover more and have a whole global insight, but there's only so much time in the day. But there's three key takeaways from that mapping that I would share with you. So the first is that policymakers are showing greater willing to regulate corporate behavior. And I think there's this clear understanding developing that we have to move beyond voluntary measures. Like we've had them in place long enough. They've not produced the results. Latest, like in the ILO statistics indicate that forced labor has gone up. And that's not just about COVID. That was before COVID because there's only half a year of COVID in those statistics. So we expect that to then actually be worse post COVID. So, so it's not delivered. And I think we know we need a level playing field and we know this can only be achieved by regulation that holds everybody to the same standards. Um, so the second is this connection of environmental and social, but we're seeing more and more that people are putting these together in the same package of measures or they're referring from one to another. There's like a growing recognition that we've, we've got to address these hand in hand as part of the same package. Uh, you know, a sustainable world, is, is for the people in it. So it's kind of, they go together, they can't be separated. And I think the third trend that we picked up on was this sense of extraterritorial legislation. So measures that impact outside your jurisdiction, which has always been quite a legal hurdle, but it's happening more and more. People, the awareness that what we're doing, you know, companies within our jurisdiction, are having massive impacts on places that are far away from us and that we need to regulate you know both for our own backyard but also for what is happening elsewhere in the world because we're not separate we're all part of the same world it all connects up um so, so i think these trends are there and personally i find that encouraging i think maybe i'm fairly optimistic but i sort of feel that although we're not maybe not in a great place right now there are reasons to think that we are trending in a better direction. So that would be my encouragement. Um, so drilling into the forced labor, so the EU's forced labor proposals, um, which in its briefest form will ban products made with forced labor from being placed on the union market or from being exported from the union to a market outside the union. Um, there was three main areas I'm gonna kind of put my thinking around. So the first would be that the scope is broad. Um, it applies to all businesses of any size. So the commission in its explanatory notes recognizes that it will be hard for small enterprises to meet the challenges, but they also recognize that you can't have an exception either. You know, you can't have a small company that can bring in these products. If you're banning them, you've got to ban them for everyone. And so kind of their compromise solution with this is to build in this idea of proportionality that for smaller businesses um, there will be some proportionality in the investigations and also in there'll be support mechanisms in place to help SMEs to kind of meet the requirements of the legislation but it's also broad in terms of the products so it's all products that have forced labor at any point in the production harvesting extraction like anywhere in the value chain and it includes components. So this bit, you know, got me quite excited because I work kind of with the fashion industry. And obviously we know there's a lot of components within the fashion industry that are potentially problematic. So even if we couldn't sort of identify forced labor within other parts, and, I, and the one I was thinking about most was obviously cotton. So what I did when I was thinking about this is I went and I looked at the US's, um, America's forced labor bans and their withhold and release orders, which is the list of orders that they've bought in for items that are banned from coming into the US market to see what percentage could be applicable to the fashion industry. So kind of in the ones that they've got listed, which I think is all, there's currently four that are related to cotton, including an entire ban on cotton from Turkmenistan. And there's one that is related to sheepskin and leather products. So that's five. And then there's an additional four that are related to apparel. And if I put all those together as a percentage, I worked it out at 16%. So, so that's kind of a significant amount that is relevant to the fashion industry. And if we take that and we think about what that will look like when the EU enacts their proposals, 
this is it's going to be quite impactful and for businesses in the uk who are not coming under these but who may import from the eu or export through the eu and i'm not quite clear what happens with items that are just in transition uh, you know i think you know post brexit the eu's laws are going to have a huge impact on us still and the argument which i wasn't going to make now for the uk to keep pace is just growing as the eu does more and more so that's my first thing um my second thing is that within this proposal there's a recognition that multiple legislative tools are needed to tackle these difficult problems in supply chain so in the explanatory notes they list various pieces that already include forced labor in their scope and yet they're bringing this new piece on top so there's this sense of like we've already done this but it's not enough so we're bringing this new piece but the other thing they've done is they explicitly link this forced labor proposal to their work on due diligence so the corporate sustainability due diligence directive they've, they've linked them together as working hand in hand to address this issue of forced labor so the way they're talking about it is that the one, the due diligence, works on the behaviour of actors in the supply chain and creates new legal responsibilities of those actors, whilst the forced labour ban is working on products and is focused on removing products from the market. And you can think of this, you know, there's, there's a moral imperative to removing products, you know, the idea that we should protect the public from purchasing products made with forced labour, but I think a second level is also this idea of cutting off the profits. So under due diligence alone, a company could be found to be in breach of due diligence guidelines, you know, going through the legal process, um, have to pay fines or whatever the sanctions are, but the products could still be on the market making profits for them. So there's something about cutting off that source of profits that I think closes a gap that could exist within due diligence. And I think this idea of multi-pronged approaches is one that I really like. We talked about in our preliminary discussions and that I would love to see more of, and I think with due diligence becomes relevant. The idea that due diligence forms this broad base, horizontal, know your supply chain. You need to know what's going on in your supply chain. Be aware of it and do your best to mitigate it. But then on top of that, for issues that are really intractable, that you know really we want to tackle, we, we build these separate pieces that kind of build a greater obligation, a greater expectation, tackle products, whatever it is. And so the other thing I was thinking I would like to see is this idea of staged rollouts of legislation, which is maybe in my little dream world, but that when we bring due diligence, we, we're not seeing that as the end point, we're seeing that as the beginning, and we're already got our eyes on what needs to come next. We're talking about it, you know, okay, we'll have two years for this to be embedded in business, and then we're looking to the next and we're maintaining momentum and we're moving forward. So that would be kind of my kind of challenge to people out there, legislators. Um, so my third point, I think I've got time, is, is a bit broader and a little bit more conceptual, but it's more related to this issue of vulnerability and forced labor definitions. And it kind of brings me back to wages. So the commission's proposal, um, relies on the ILO's definition of forced labour. And if you dig into the ILO's supporting documentation, so they have their 10 indicators, and then they have their tools for national action plans, you get some kind of expansion on what these definitions are, what constitutes forced labour, and they discuss, you know, what does the menace of any penalty mean? What does lack of voluntariness look like? But for me reading it, I feel there's this kind of thread that runs throughout, which is this issue of vulnerability. So, you know, what makes a person vulnerable to forced labor abuse? What sort of situation leaves a person in a place where they can't walk away from work, when they're threatened with violence, when they receive verbal abuse? You know, why do people have to accept exploitative working conditions in order to survive? And so the ILO is clear that exploitative work does not equate to forced labor, but that I would suggest there's also this gray area and, and there's a spectrum from one to the other. And we could you know, question where the overlap is. When does it tip over from exploitative working practices into forced labor? And from the perspective of garment workers and the work I do and the reports I read, 
I do see these as quite blended issues. But I think if we think of non-payment of a living wage as a systemically accepted intergenerational issue, we, we can consider what impact that has um, in terms of ongoing low-level wages, um, increasing women's vulnerability to further abuse and potentially to forced labour abuse. And the abuses we could list that we know from multiple reports garment workers face include such things as gender-based violence in the factory setting, forced overtime, or certainly overtime that cannot not be refused, either because you've got a threat of dismissal or because you have to take it to survive, to earn enough money. Um, we've heard of instances of workers being locked into buildings to complete orders under time pressure. You know, we know of cases where workers have been in unsafe buildings and some very high profile cases with that. And, you know, we also know of the withholding of wages and the non-payment of severance pay. And particularly this was highlighted during COVID. So, you know, while many workers' experiences might not hit the bar to be defined as forced labor under the ILO definitions, I sort of personally think there's a risk factor there for businesses in terms of what is in their supply chains. But I also think if we're truly wanting to change these issues, you know, not just be compliant with legislation, I think we can talk about how empowering it is through payment of their wages would help to reduce their vulnerability. And in doing so would help the fight against forced labor. So, you know, to wrap up, I think in light of this, and in light of the legislation that's coming, I was thinking about this idea of multi-pronged approaches. Um, you know, I would really like to see kind of the thinking now about what are the additional measures that will go on top of due diligence? You know, what, what do we need to bring alongside this to really make these proposals work? And obviously I would strongly put forward wage measures as part of that, but I know, you know, many colleagues who work in other areas who would have other suggestions that are also very strong and and probably it's not either or it's probably all of them, you know, we need to look at all of them and as Lola said, you know, um, looking at shareholder primacy, I feel is key purchasing practices are key, but there's so many angles, and I think they all need to be held at once and thought. about. So on that note, I will hand back to you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your insight and perspective there and for giving us a sense of not just some of the legislation that's coming up, but some of the thinking or um, consistent approach or the story it starts to tell when you consider it in the round. Um, so thank you enormously for that. Um, uh, I think what uh, so we've got some questions so I'll just answer I'm going to answer I'm going to ask one question if I may and then we'll go to some of the Q&A um, and then if we get some more Q&A we'll stick there and otherwise we'll go back to me ask you a question which is I'm going to ask a little bit of a reductive question forgive me because I think what we've, we've amazingly explored some of the uh, complex issues that are driving some of these um, wrongs in the supply chain and some of the ways that we're getting an approach to fixing them via due diligence. My reductive question is, if a business wants to think, what do I do or kind of where next? Um, you've pointed to some areas, so kind of around collaboration or best practice in terms of pilots, or, I mean, I know there's toolkits out there, for example. Is there anything that either of you would point to in terms of best practice as a model to work to or great sources of info or just anything where you can think businesses can go for for help in these areas? Can I say, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, Lucy, and, and something that I think Jackie's alluded to and, and myself as well, and you certainly have, is this thing about collaboration in a non-competitive space. So people need to be able to get together and sort of um, have those uh, conversations about what works in, in particular areas and, and what isn't working and why, without sort of feeling that there's some kind of commercial sensitivity involved. I do think that's important. But I think um, sort of beyond that, my feeling is that we're beyond the stage of people needing sort of awareness raising, right? 
I mean, there's no, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, you could have said, well, I didn't know any of this was going on or, or whatever. But, you know, everybody now, almost everybody has access uh, certainly, um, you know, where we are based in the UK and in most of the EU, I would imagine, and the US and other countries, we, we, we know that these issues, it's not like it's anything new. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Interestingly, um, somebody referred to the Union Carbide um, tragedy at Bhopal. Now, how long ago was that? It was yeah. over 20 years ago. And even before that, you know, you, you can cite all these instances. So, um, the, um, I know you weren't suggesting awareness raising, but what I'm saying is that the company, I always want to turn that, that back to companies and say, what do you think? What do you think you ought to be doing? Because, you know, you've been the architects of, of, of where we are at in terms of business models, um, what is considered to be corporate responsibility and whatever. You've constructed those models and sucked us as consumers into into feeding that model so now now that you know what is the disaster or the disasters that are happening around the world as a result of this and what we can prevent then what are you what do you think you should be doing get on the case and uh, yes there is um uh, a degree of uh, pressure from some investors not all still some investing bodies don't really care too much but there are more and more saying we want a really active notion of ESG, environment, social and governance that really addresses these big challenges. But by and large, I would say there are plenty of, um, there's the there's even things like the Corporate Justice Coalition or the British Retail Consortium who absolutely back mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. So there are companies who are signing up to these areas. And, and, and so it, it's out there just sort of, do it really yes <laughs> and the gap between um what can be in a sustainability strategy and then actually what happens on the ground can be vast right so the gap between yeah. um well yeah your esg uh commitments and then actually what happens on the ground can be huge um mm. Becky, did you want to pick up on that i think from my perspective Having talked to people who work in the fashion industry and hearing sometimes, you know, I have some sympathy for the fact that it can be difficult to implement some changes. And um, I think particularly into re in relation to work wages with the way the current system works. So I think that's where I would just like to see more businesses stepping up to the plate to really go to the governments and ask for legislation. But what we see instead is business lobbies kind of working to water down the legislation that's being proposed. So, and I would also say to businesses, you know, maybe be aware of what your business lobby is doing and make sure they align with really what your goals are. And as I was talking about what people have on their websites as their kind of sustainability goals. But I just, I think if more turned around and said, yeah, actually we, we can't meet these things and we need help to meet it. If society really believes that this is what, needs to happen we need a new framework within which to operate we should help to get there right and that to me is interesting. it picks up on the um the culture point that we were discussing before this as well that actually you know what comes first legislation or culture and often actually the um what can seem like small incremental behaviors that we can all take as individuals or citizens can actually ladder up to these huge systemic changes when we think about the changes that we've seen in, you know, plant-based eating or plastics um, and how that's really been driven by citizens rather than necessarily businesses or policymakers. And for me, that B Corp piece again is, is business culture changing, right? Lola? Yes, and I, I think that's a, a good example, plant-based eating. So yes, we as citizens in, in varying degrees have sort of created or, or sort of you know recognized what this might mean and therefore fed um i keep using food metaphors now but you know there's been a number of companies who produce um uh, plant-based food etc cetera, etc cetera. they're not all thriving those companies and it, you know if we if we're to look at it systemically and i do i do absolutely agree 
that it's also down to governments to, to give the support and the help that, that is necessary. Because it's like, to me, it's like, if you're a farmer, what is your incentive to move from dairy into, um, you know, plant forms that can feed into this particular sector? You know, where, 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 the, where are the incentives? Because at the moment, what happens is if you do want to do an entirely plant-based diet and you want to have some burger type food and sausage type food, you've got to pay over the odds. So, you know, for all of us as, as, as citizens who want to make those changes, why should we have to pay more mm -hmm. to, um, to, to, to do that? So, um, and why should farmers and the agricultural industry suffer in order to do that? So without some really deep and creative thinking that involves the different stakeholders, the different actors within a particular sector, you know, these changes are going to be very difficult to enact. And I think the same goes for the clothing industry too. Mm. Mm. Thinking through the justice implications of each of these. Okay, I'm going to go to the Q&A because I realise we've got about 12 minutes left and we've got six questions there. So we'll motor through as many as we can. So the first is from Elaine. Thanks, Elaine. Um, who says, uh, who owns this in business? It needs to be mainstream and not consigned to the risk or legal team. Agree, disagree? I think I think you've got a wholehearted agreement there, <laughs> Elaine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. Because I, I thought the question was going to go, who owns this? This should not be delegated to the sustainability officer, which is another right. way of kind of, or can be, not in every case. And I've sort of echoed Jackie's point there. It's not all bad news. But, but sometimes, I mean, I, I know somebody who's trying to do something around sustainability, and the chief sustainability officer in a number of organizations has said, yes, 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 great idea. But when it goes to the chief finance officer or the legal people or the chief operations persons, they say, no, 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 we can't do that. You know, again, that's within the company. That's for them to sort that out mm -hmm. because you, otherwise you've got a huge disjuncture between what they're saying they're doing around environmental sustainability and human rights and what is actually happening. These breaks need to be taken off and, and, and a solution found. Right. Uh, Jackie, I'm going to go to you as well with the next one, if I may, but both J Jackie and Lola. So from Rebecca, thanks, Rebecca. We've got a question around, well, first of all, thanks to you both. And Rebecca asked, I've heard companies saying that the EU legislation would only work if companies get assurance that they can be transparent about their supply chains without fearing prosecution. What do you think of this? Is there any chance of some kind of protection being added in the EU legislation? And if so, wouldn't that defeat the purpose of the corporate sustainability or the CSRD? What, any thoughts or? I, suppose, I haven't heard that argument myself. I think at the moment, the issue of what the sanctions will be is still kind of in the debating stage. And there's some fear that it's being watered down too much. Um, yeah. I mean, because I think like some of the sanctions will be in relation to not conducting your due diligence. So if you conduct your due diligence, you, you can show that there's something in your supply chain, but you have to show that you're taking steps to mitigate. And I think, I think you know, they're also, I think, bringing in changes about the idea of phasing, phasing things in. There'd, there'd be some sense that obviously at first, when this is new, you're going to discover things. It's whether you're mitigating it, are you taking steps? And I think that's the whole purpose of it, isn't, isn't really to kind of prosecute people, although we would say that sanctions need to be there, but it's actually to drive the kind of to incentivize action that mitigates the harms. And there's, there's things in there about, you know, you don't just withdraw when you um, identify a risk, you actually stay engaged in order to mitigate. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, to me, it feels like a not not a very good um, argument. Yeah, I'm just going to jump around the questions a little bit because I see there's one here that I know you both have been discussing in some depth from Katie. Thank you, Katie. Do you think we'll see a strengthening of policy in the UK following the EU regulations? <laughs> well, Lola's probably oh, better paced to, to speak mm. to that, being in the heart or. I 
Yes, well, I try, I try to be positive about these things. And, and let's say, you know, we, it, it won't come without a struggle. It won't come without a battle and without a, a demonstration of support, because actually some of you with long memories may um, recall that there was an independent review of the working of uh, the Modern Slavery Act. And in it, um, there are a number of suggestions for change around the Section 54 transparency in supply chains, um, which is far less robust than anything that the EU is suggesting. And the government at the time, um, sort of like four prime ministers ago, said that they, that they would, yes, bring forth legislation to strengthen Section 54 in a number of different ways. And so that was when Theresa May was mm. prime minister. And now, so what are we, two, three years down the line? And we're still waiting. And every time somebody asks what's happening to the strengthening of the Modern Slavery Act, the answer is we are awaiting parliamentary time, to which my response is, well, who organises parliamentary time? So, um, you know, we're not giving up on that. No. Um, and we're still trying to sort of, as it were, approach the, the challenges from a number of different areas, but we're, we're not giving up on that. But it is, it is the case that um, one might argue, and let's hope we're proved wrong, but that the current government may not be sympathetic to a piece of legislation that is coming out from the EU. Yes, I mean, the current trend does seem to be deregulated all over the place. So. Yeah, um, but, but Jackie, sorry, sorry, Lucy, just to quickly say, as Jackie yeah. said earlier, but if you're a British business and you want to operate in any of those jurisdictions, you'll still right. be liable, so yeah. So, and, and if you're an American business or any business in these jurisdictions, um, I've got two questions I'm going to squatch together, if I may, because they are basically both about businesses' voluntary commitments, um, and there's a bit of multi-solving in there as well. So, um, Kiku, uh, who's at Futera, thanks, Kiku, um, said, uh, what role do businesses' voluntary efforts play, if at all? And then David Wilcox, thank you, David, has um, asked a question about if anyone's I don't know the answer to this, by the way. If anyone is um, doing a, a map uh, between uh, companies who are violating, basically, if there's any crossover between mapping human rights and mapping um, abuses and mapping net zero commitments, with the idea being, if if you're concealing one, you're unlikely to be, to be actioning the other. Um, and Jackie, I know you've done some work on hotspots and mapping hotspots within human rights abusers, I believe, or reviewing some of the work that's been done. So I don't know if you want to touch on that or anyway, question on businesses, voluntary commitments and whether you see any overlap between mapping of human rights abusers and negative or positive environmental impact. I think that personally, my mapping doesn't kind of map, you were talking about violations, weren't you? Where yeah, we haven't kind of mapped violations. We were just mapping um, legislative initiatives. Right. I think there's got to be, I feel like the Business Human Rights Research Centre does a lot of mapping of cases that are going on around the world. And I think Lola, like you talked a lot about the Rights Lab in Nottingham. So there's got to be people who have mapped one, like the human rights and other people who've mapped environment and whether anyone's actually thought about bringing them together to see if there is isn't that correlation that would actually be quite interesting to know. And also to see where there isn't, like where people are doing great environmental work, but doing nothing on human rights or vice versa. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know, Lola, if you're aware of anything more. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a very good question. And in fact, um, you've mentioned the rights lab. And as, as, as Lucy said earlier, I'm a chancellor at Nottingham University, so I am somewhat biased in this respect, but the rights lab, have done an amazing amount of research in this whole field. And in fact, where I first heard about the links between environmental sustainability and um, human rights and modern slavery was at the Rights Lab several years ago. So I can check if we, we will have, a, obviously we've got a recording of the session and we'll have a note. Um, I will check with them to see what, if anything, is currently being done, because I think that would be a really interesting piece of work that, that may be out there already in some shape or form, but it'd be good to know. Great. Um, and more widely on businesses' voluntary efforts, I mean, do they play a part? Well, yes, of course they do. Um, 
again, I guess um, it's about the robustness of them. Mm. So um, it's hard to say because I don't want to single out individual um, companies, but you know, you 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 could have a company that um, um, has a foundation or a charity or or or, or even um, you know sets up a school um, in in the, in um, right. in the global south somewhere. Um, which does, which is really good, and it's great to have a school that's properly equipped and good buildings and everything, but still carry on with some of the practices that are uh, that are detrimental to those communities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of voluntary sort of schemes, yes, it's great that that some of them happen. But again, if they're used as a way with this term now, purpose washing, um, to you know, which is alongside greenwashing, if they're used as a way to do that, sure, there are some benefits for people, but they're not deeply embedded, you know, enough, and they're not um, um, making enough of a change within the deep infrastructure, the system, to make that difference sustainable, and, and that's the issue. So what happens if a CEO comes along and thinks, oh, well, I'm fed up with this school business or, yeah, we'll just do the school business and not bother about cleaning the river? You know, that's kind of caricature, but that's what yeah, I'm talking about. No, totally. I mean, I've been impressed in recent years that there's, there's, there's more, you know, as we've only got seven years, <laughs> that there is... A, a more of a recognition of that you can have a very strategic role for philanthropy that can actually mesh in with materiality and business efforts and that to me is because always before they seem to be somewhat separate that to me is, is interesting it's showing how you can pull different levers um, in order to create change but we are almost at time so I'm going to give the final word to uh, Jackie and Lola is there any kind of call or uh, change you'd like to see um, uh, Lola, I'll go first to you. Jackie, I'll go to you. Um, that you'd love to see in the industry. Oh, I think you're mute. Oh. No, oh, you're back. You're back. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, yes. I, I, I guess just to reiterate what I've said already, at the risk of sort of being a bit of a bore. Um, but I would say that legislation isn't the only thing, right? It's not a magic formula for, for solving everything it has to be people understanding that we we're all sharing and it sounds a bit hippy dippy but we're all sharing this space and we have to understand that that all people have a right to a clean environment and to have agency and anything we do to block that is is just not acceptable mm -hmm. right jackie well, there's lots of things I could say. One thing I often think, which is maybe a little bit off center, is I would really like to see more openness and honesty that is possible. So I think I think sometimes the debate gets polarized and brands, you know, within the garment industry, they get painted as, you know, they get hauled out for a kind of something in their supply chain, taken through the media, and there's this polarization. And actually that drives a lot of what goes on more into hiding. Like we talk about transparency, they don't want to bring it into the open. But for me, kind of what I've learned from talking to industry experts has really helped me understand a lot more some of the challenges they face, particularly if they want to implement a living wage, but they struggle to do that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of often just feel I would like to see less polarization and more of this sense of like yes this is this is a difficult this is difficult to solve let's get together and solve it and and space within which kind of brands can talk honestly about the challenges they face without kind of fearing repercussions so that we can look to solve them so that we can look to move forward that's kind of what i would love to see more Thank you. Let's not encircle the wagons and shot, start shooting inwards. Let's actually collaborate. Um, thank you both so much. Um, I will let you go. It's at time. Thank you, everyone who's joined. Thank you for all your questions. You. So nice to meet you all virtually and have great rest of days, weeks, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for organising. Ah, oh, cheers. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.